I killed somebody. I stabbed him 152 times. He was uh, saying that he was all right, that he, he he realized that he was sorry that he hurt her, she was a nice girl, and stuff like that. So insincere in, in all the other statements that he made. He was just uh, full of hate. Clearly, he was crazy, if for no other reason, that, that obviously he did what he did, which is totally senseless a thing. Very bizarre thing. Because I got that stigma to of being mentally ill, I'm never to be trusted. On March 6, 1969, a 19-year-old drifter named Hugh Kelly stabbed Dolores Anderson to death in one of the most gruesome and senseless murders in the history of Times Square. Homicide detective William McNeely has spent his entire career walking this beat. He joined the force after serving in World War II. In those days, you just didn't get plopped into an air-conditioned radio car. You walked that street and you learn the people on the street, the characters, the residents, and everybody. And homicides in every one of these hotels in the time of, you know, in the homicide squad. When I first got an homicide, I was bored and stiff. But then once it started hitting, oh my God. This was a, a den of iniquity, this whole area for a while, you know. They used to tease you, as a matter of fact. They'd say, uh, Hey, you doing night duty here? Yeah. Better come down here. Why? Oh, a lot of blood, a lot of blood. <laughs> if these buildings could talk, you know? Fantastic. This is the street where the hotel was, the place of occurrence. It was the Bel Air. Never did I believe that I would have a homicide like Dolores Anderson in that building. In 1969, Times Square was a magnet for night crawlers and broken souls. Dolores Anderson was one of those souls. It was here in Times Square that she met a mysterious drifter. Hugh Kelly was a wiry 19-year-old. He was strong, silent, and showed no outward signs of what was raging underneath. Their brief affair would change both their lives forever. So here it is, this girl's walking down the street. Says, you looking for a date, young man? Says, no. And he told her about having fallen out with his girlfriend. And he had no place to stay. And she said, well, my hotel is reasonable. Maybe I can talk to the manager, you know, get a room in my hotel. She says, what's the matter? Are you afraid of me? And that was it. And that, that, that was the trigger, I says. Afraid of you, huh? OK, I'll show you how afraid of you I am. This, this I said in my mind. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to be around anybody. I just wanted to walk away down the street. We went back to our hotel room, and uh, we had sex. And that's when the, sh the, the homicide occurred. And he told me that she mentioned something to him about his old girlfriend being some kind of a bitch to treat him like that. And he got incensed, and he strangled her. Dolores Anderson, I'll never forget it, you know? I'll never forget the name. How could, how could I not? Yeah, of course, you know? She says to me, Kelly, pass me the match over there. I said, OK. Well, she never lit that cigarette. He has described himself, a state of mind at the time, as both rageful and also detached. I heard her talking to me while I was doing it, but obviously that can't happen. Please stop, please stop. She couldn't have said something like that. It was impossible. I stabbed her 152 times. The eyes popped out. 
There are burn marks all over the body. And over here, you'll see the big patch that he cut out of her leg. That piece of flesh is laying in there, shriveled up. That's the piece of flesh from putting it on the stove. There had to have been blood all over the place. I didn't see any. The knife, I had it in my right hand. It just fell out of my hand, hit the floor, and vanished, disappeared. He had written on the, on the wall over the bed, stop me or I will kill again. Ripping somebody's arm off at the elbow? Is that anger or what? And that's exactly what I did, my friend. This guy had periods where he was just uh, mad at the world. Not only her, anybody else, mad at the world. That he harbored rage against the women, I think, uh, pretty much proven by what he did to that poor woman. That lady just happened to be the unfortunate in the, in the wrong place at the wrong time. One time he knew what he was doing, and then the next thing he's out of it. Strange right? Sick shit. Why would I do something like that? Did I know then? No, I didn't, but I know now. I didn't, I didn't see anything wrong in what I did. I got back on my clothes. I left. Then I must have ran when I got out of the hotel, maybe about 50 blocks. I, mean, I could fly and fly. And the day after I did that, I, what did I do? Slice my arms with razor blades, swallow the razor blades, try to take an overdose of drugs. It was just too painful, man. How I ever got from there to right now is something that I can't understand at all. I don't think too many people can understand it themselves either. Today, at age 50, Hugh Kelly rides the New York City subway. He has spent more than two-thirds of his life behind bars or in a mental ward for committing a gruesome act of murder. His violent journey began at age nine when he was shipped away to a mental hospital. Not too many people recover from the problems that I had, emotional problems that I had. When they label you childhood schizophrenic, you have a hopeless mental condition. From 59 until 1962, I was away as a child. Rockland Psychiatric Center, the children's unit. I'm nine years old when I go to the hospital. I was put in with 12 and 13 year old kids. That's like throwing meat to the sharks. They beat me up all the time, taking advantage of the, of the weakest person. All I knew, I, I had to fight to survive. <laughs> fight, 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 fight. You, you know, I'd rather be away and fight with another kid than have to protect myself from getting beat from my father. Kelly's father was a heavy drinker. He would humiliate his little son by forcing him to stick by his side during all-night binges at neighborhood bars. Kelly's mother and sister would do nothing to protect him from his father. What happens during Christmas? My sister would be sitting on the couch. I'd be sitting right next to her. My dad comes into the house and, uh, how's my favorite little girl? Or something to that effect. Gives her a Christmas present. Daddy, what about me? You want your present now? I said, yeah. Boom. Right off the couch onto the floor. I wished him dead so many times. Then when he finally died, that's when I went off the deep end because I felt that I had killed him by wishing him dead. Kelly's father died of alcoholism and liver failure. That was the turning point. In... Dr. Richard Wiedenbacher has researched the roots of Kelly's violence. What he seemed to emphasize during the period I knew him was the loneliness and the degradation he experienced um, with his mother, grandmother, uh, and sisters. They subjugated him, they humiliated him, they controlled him, they dominated him. He was rageful at what they did to him. My mother has to play father and mommy at the same time. She's never home, okay? My grandmother lives with us. 
She brought her emotional baggage into the house. Grandmother was angry. She had had her own problems, I think, too. When I walk into my kitchen, I got this little walk-in pantry. I always look at it and I smile. I say, Jesus Christ, I'm glad I didn't. that wasn't in my house when I was a kid. Because if it was, I knew my grandmoms would have locked me up in that little pantry all the time. <laughs> I says, thank God society didn't have to suffer for that one, you know? Uh, I don't think there's any doubt but that this man was terribly ambivalent, <laughs> deeply divided inwardly with regard to his approach to uh, females. It's Valentine's Day. It's assembly. i never forget this. Everybody makes out Valentine's Day cards. You know, you draw them with crayons. You go over to the person who you want to give the Valentine's Day card to, and you make nice, nice. I knew a girl that I wanted to give it to. So I gave it to her. She said, I don't want it. <laughs> the, the end of the world, you know, true love in the first grade. She's in the sandbox. I took a handful of sand and put it in her mouth. According to Kelly's psychiatrists, his violence towards women was learned from his alcoholic father. Everybody in the neighborhood knew I was crazy Huey because that I'd go away, I'd come back, I'd go away, I'd come back. However they found out, they knew I was going away to a nut house. From 14 to 16, I was in and out of the hospital. One doctor told my mom, someday your son is going to do something very violent. No one could get close to me. There was a wall, man. I was on one side and everybody else was on the other side. Because of the turmoil in my family, or the turmoil in my head, let's, that, that's, let's be more specific, uh, I had to leave my, my house. So I did along with my, the girl I was with at the time. Her name was Rosemary. She was four months pregnant with my son. Well, I met her in a nut house. It's a nut house romance. Those are the best. You know, no questions asked. No prejudgments, no judgments or nothing. I wouldn't go with anybody if they weren't crazy. We ran away together, okay? And we were living in Times Square in the hotels. If we didn't have $10 for the hotel room, we'd pay 75 cents a piece for the movies. So you stay there all day long, 22 hours, I think it was. Seeing the same movie over and over and over again. Eh. It was a life. We would uh, panhandle, hang out uh, around Times Square. I didn't steal too much at that time uh, because I, I just didn't think about doing that stuff. At age 17, Kelly turned to robbery to make a living. In the neighborhood I grew up in, I knew when people would go to work, when they would come home. Must have committed at least two or 300 burglaries before I got caught. At age 18, Kelly was convicted for burglary and sent to Rikers Island for six months. While he was in jail, Rose Marie, now his common-law wife, gave birth to their son, Hugh Jr. Huey was uh, born while I was in jail. Uh, I was six, he was six, I was six months old. Oh, what a Freudian slip. When I got out of Rikers Island, I remember when she asked me to go into the house, uh, Huey, you home? Come and see your son, come and see your son. I couldn't pick him up. I turned around and walked out of the bedroom and I went outside. I didn't know it at the time, but why I was scared. But I was just scared I would never go by him. Automatically, she thinks I don't love the kid. But that's why I was staying away. Because I didn't want to hurt him. If you live in a household in which your father is uh, drinking and cursing and maybe beating your mom, doesn't everyone know that uh, children copy their parents? From father to son to father to son, you know, it, it, it's a never-ending vicious cycle, man. It gets put on from one generation to the next. If there's early violence, trauma, brutalization in the, the child's home, then the child that's what the child learns and later will be violent. In the weeks after he returned home from jail, Kelly's emotions unraveled. I never hit a woman before. We were sitting in a, at the kitchen table one day, and she says, Huey, why don't you start, start acting like a man? I says, acting like a man? OK. I gave her a right hook that flew her out of the chair into the next room. And that was the beginning of the end. Everything went downhill from there. He went to uh, Kings Park State Hospital in December of 1968, uh, sought admission there. He pretty clearly 
had some vague feeling at least that a volcano was going to explode. I go to Kings Park. I saw four psychiatrists at one time. Well, Mr. Kelly, uh, what seems to be your problem? How do you feel? I feel so dead inside, but I know something is in there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say, formulate something, but they can't understand. I'm trying to give them all the symbolism they can get. Instead, I didn't know I was going to kill somebody, but what I was painting the picture of in my own way was, it's going to hit the fan and you guys are gonna pay for it. According to Kelly, the doctors gave him antidepressants, but no further psychotherapy. The only thing they did for two weeks was let me play ping pong all day long. Kind of sh is that. No one ever came to talk to me after that. Kelly panicked and escaped. So one day, someone opened up the door to let a visitor in. I tapped the guy on the shoulder, he turned around that way, I walked out the door. Kelly returned to Times Square to wander the streets at night. Lonely and full of fury, he kept hearing voices in his head, pleading for help. In less than 72 hours, he would commit a monstrous act of murder. Kelly heard voices in his head. He committed himself to a mental institution in Brooklyn, New York. The overworked staff couldn't see anything seriously wrong and let him slip away. Kelly was drawn back to the seedy streets of Times Square. He couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep. He didn't know if everyone was looking at him or if no one knew he even existed. So here it is, this girl's walking down the street the first night. I says, you looking for a date, young man? She says, no. You know what she says? She says, what's the matter, you afraid of me? That was it, afraid of you, huh? Okay, I'll show you how afraid of you I am. Did this I said in my mind. Dolores Anderson, pretty girl. She wasn't dumb. She graduated high school. She held a couple of good jobs, but she did start drinking when this thing uh, culminated in her death. She wanted to get too close to me, and I didn't want anybody to get close to me. At the time that he started this orgy, they were having sex, and he told me that she mentioned something to him about his old girlfriend being some kind of a bitch. And he strangled her so hard that her right eye popped right out of her head. When we got there, it was hanging on her cheek. This woman makes a comment about his uh, wife that's threatening. You know that girl, Rosemary's no good. You should leave her and stay with me. He can't say that that's upsetting to him. And what happens is it comes out in this very primitive, concrete form in his expression of rage, which brutalizes her. Right in the middle of a conversation, she says to me, Kelly, pass me the match over there. I said, OK. Well, she never lit that cigarette. Nobody deserves to die like that. It was horrific, horrific, the, the scene. Her face was disfigured, but she was covered with a uh, bedspread. The maid thought the woman under the blanket was sleeping. She went to shake her, and her left forearm and hand fell out from under the blanket onto the floor. Ripping somebody's arm off at the elbow? Is that fucking anger or what? And that's exactly what I did, my friend. And it was a left arm. And my grandmother was left-handed, and that's the hand she always hit me with. Rage, violent, homicidal rage that, you know, he just wanted to kill these women that dominated him, humiliated him, made him submit. I killed a lot of people that night. I killed my mother, I killed my grandmother, uh, my sisters. Everybody was dead that night, you know. That woman at that time asking for the match triggered off the abuse and domination that he experienced between the three females that, grew, that brought him up. I remember when I was a child, I was cleaning the hallway, okay, and my grandmother was overseeing it. She happened to not like the way I was cleaning the room. And she happened to stab me with a pencil in the leg. And the piece of lead broke off. I still got that piece of lead in my leg, and I still see it. That's the same exact spot where I stabbed that woman. He had cut a, an 8 by 10 piece out of her left thigh because he was trying to burn her body with that hot plate. But every time he would bring it over from the dresser to the bed, 
pull, the plug would pull out of the wall. I cut open her stomach, and this was the thought in my head at the time. I can crawl back into my mother's stomach and disappear, and then I, from, I'd become unborn, right? And then go back into my father. I don't know, he said he, he first he did this, and then he went back and did something else. And then he hesitated, and then he went back and did something else. So, uh, you know, it wasn't just a zip, 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 zip. Didn't time to think about it. In my opinion, the reason why I am able to be out here today is because I could never forget that. But he remembered everything he did in that room, and he told us everything he did. Uh, it is kind of unusual. Strange, right? Six. Why would I do something like that? Did I know then? No, I didn't. But I know now. He did act like we were going to give him a medal for what he did and telling us all how he did it and so on. So, uh, so that's not a stable mind, I'm sure. <laughs> Employees and residents of the hotel were questioned. In the end, a palm print led to Kelly's arrest. Uh, he had written on the, on the wall over the bed, stop me or I will kill again. Oh, please stop me or I will kill again. The fingerprints were a little smudged, but that palm print came up beautiful. And we identified that with uh, Kelly. A perfect James Cagney movie, right? I wind up in a church. I jump out of a window 200 feet high. I break my leg. I break my arm. My son's mother has my six-month-old son in his arm, her arms, OK? The priest is standing over me, giving me the last rites. The homicide detectives are in the room. Uh, what's this priest here for? Well, you're going to die. You, well, I'm coming in out of a coma, right? Huey, you got to confess to this crime because you're about to die. Me die? I ain't going to die. But you want to know? Yeah, I killed the woman. McNeely has a different memory of Kelly's capture. Mr. Kelly. <clears throat> back out to Brooklyn to do a burglary. Once he got in there, it was up on the third floor. He couldn't get out. He tried to slide down out the window, and he hit the second floor. And he was found lying out there with a broken leg. So they took him into the hospital, and so they notified the detectives. I went out to Brooklyn, printed him, palm printed him, and it was beautiful. And there were two uniformed police officers signed outside that ward. As nuts as he was, as crazy as he was, he was a fox because he went back into the ward and he says to the guys in the ward, that guy ain't kidding me. He says, that detective, he's a homicide detective. As soon as those two cops out there on the bench in the hall doze off, I'm getting out of here. But fortunately, there was a guy in there who was a corrections officer and he had his appendix taken out and he was part of the group in just as one of the patients. So he says to me, I, I gotta come out and tell you, he says, that guy you just printed, he's getting out of here because he knows you're a homicide detective. Go well, down, I got the two cops, and I said to him, you got an extra set of handcuffs on you? Well, you handcuff him to that bed. Kelly was ordered held without bail after an arraignment in criminal court. But the two-month investigation didn't end the way McNeely had planned. We didn't go to the trial because the psychiatrist suggested incarceration in the mental institution and then we'd see what they could do for him then bring him back for possible prosecution. Kelly was incarcerated waiting to stand trial because he was not fit. He was that crazy. He was not fit to stand trial for a number of years. I think it was four years. Maybe it was five. The district attorney offered him a plea. If he would plead guilty to manslaughter, he would get a seven-year stretch with time served, which means he'd do just another two years. Instead, Kelly took an insanity plea. If I would have went to jail, I would have only done six years and eight months. And the general public thinks that the mental hospital is a cakewalk and that people should go to prison. But in general, people will spend a lot more time for the same crime in a mental hospital than prison. And Kelly's a perfect example of that. Kelly was locked away in a maximum security hospital for the criminally insane. A handful of psychiatrists tried to put his shattered mind back together again, but by all accounts, Kelly was a lost cause. What happened next surprised everyone. 
Hugh Kelly stabbed Dolores Anderson 152 times, but he didn't go to jail. Instead of a prison term, Hugh Kelly was ordered to a mental hospital. When Hugh was coming, before he came, uh, his write-up came with him. It sent chills up and down my spine, as I think it did to other people. Everyone is reading it, and everyone's anxiety level goes through the roof. I do remember it getting blown out about his eating the parts of the woman. This was in my folder for the longest time. A really nice uh, introduction to who I was. Kind of ghoulish, you know. I mean, what could I say? It was very prejudicial to see this before they even talked to me. I'm not being treated for the crime I committed. I'm being treated for a mental illness that I had that caused me to commit the crime. I was the head of the unit. My job wasn't really to take any cases, but nobody wanted this case. He had extremely, extremely psychotic, violent rage that was beyond 99% of the people you'd meet. That, with the other end of the spectrum, this over, over, over control, so that you didn't necessarily see the pathology. The control he had was to appear to be extremely normal. He could pass for a staff member. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with him. I had therapy every day, every day without stop. He wanted to find any way he could not come to therapy. The stuff he had underneath was extremely, extremely frightening, understandably so. He had rage beyond rage. Uh, and the, the violence and the psychosis there was awesome. Back then, the fireworks used to go off in my head, man, thinking about things. He wanted to kill me. He was overwhelmed with these impulses that were coming out that he had wanted to just forget about. You just saw sometimes these black eyes that were like scary, empty black eyes. The first thing they do would, would medicate me. And it's not because I needed it. It wasn't because I was acting violent. It was because they felt extremely uncomfortable with me in the closed room and no one else. So they would have to medicate me to help them feel good. The hospital did not want to see, certainly, this guy, you know, losing the controls and acting out. He used to get, try to get me to talk about my moms, right? And I said, Arthur, I'm not ready for this. What I tried to do was to try to show him that this rage that he's feeling now is a result of of feelings from another time and place. You can't force me to talk about my moms. You don't know what you're dealing with here. Well, you got to. I said, OK. I come into this room one more time, I'm going to kill you. That's a, this administrative decision. He's gone to Mid-Hudson. Kelly was transferred to the Mid-Hudson Psychiatric Center, where controls were even more strict. Kelly was shaken by the acts of violence he witnessed I'll never forget it. This guy cannot get out of this yard. I mean, he just went crazy for some reason. He just ran to the fence. There's razor wire all over the place. Double fences, razor wire in between, triple razor wire on top. He just climbs two feet on the fence. These guys jump on him. They put him in a straitjacket, but the whole thing is that they carried him face down. One had him over here, one had him on his legs, and one had him on his pants. But the straitjackets over here, they come out of the, the jail ward, they call it, and he says, he's dead. I don't know how it happened. I said, Jesus Christ, this guy didn't know how it happened. He strangled him with that. And over the years, it's been like that. With my own eyes, I've seen 20 people murdered. Do you know what a, the snap of a human being's back sounds like when it breaks? I've heard it quite a few times when people getting stomped to death. And yet that was done by people who worked for the state of New York. Could I prove it? No. Do I know any names? No. Can't prove a damn thing. I'm crazy, but I ain't stupid. I ain't saying shit, because I got to go back on that ward where the same people who killed somebody the day before is still working. Kelly is transferred again, this time to the Manhattan Psychiatric Center. It was in an upholstery workshop at the mental hospital that Kelly's life took its next surprising turn he met a young woman named Abiba. She, she was so beautiful. I said, that's it, that's it. Bolt the lightning, this is it. She seemed really spacey. 
but it's really sweet, almost unbelievable to think of her as committing a homicide. They had monthly or weekly dances? Yeah, I think monthly, I think. Yeah, monthly with the female patients. But Abiba would never dance with me. Uh, Why didn't you want to dance with me when I asked? You asked me? Oh, you lie like dog. Uh, uh, Tell us one thing. What? How did you get out of your country? Um. Eh? It's easy to pull teeth and ask her questions. <laughs> she had intentionally scalded to death uh, a man, a member of the Ethiopian consulate in New York City, who had been asked by her family back in Ethiopia to rescue her from her alleged, quote, slavery, end of quotes. She scalded uh, her uh, rescuer to death as he lay asleep in bed at night by pouring uh, first one and then a second uh, pot or pan of, I guess, boiling hot water on him. The question, of, of course, was, um, what on earth did she do this for? It was as a side of that she must have been insane in as much as she killed the man who had rescued her from slavery. And uh, she ended up at Mid-Hudson Psychiatric Center. And uh, I'm glad things worked out the way they did. Well, I was hoping we'd get married if she'd have my hand in marriage. Not many men would have her and not many women would have him. And it was a natural fitting. Salvation is right here. That woman, my wife, Abiba. I would have went to jail, I would have only done six years and eight months. As it stands, I got not guilty by reasons of insanity. That is an endless sentence, it's a lifelong sentence. You can die behind bars. Everybody thinks that this insanity plea is this big cop-out, and people get such a good deal, and it's not the case. I've had a number of clients say to me, I made a mistake, I want to plead guilty. You cannot take a guilty plea after they've been acquitted because it's double jeopardy. So they have to remain confined until the system will release them, if ever. Between 1969, the year of the crime, and 1980, Hugh Kelly lived in five different mental institutions in the New York City area. No one's never gonna get out. They're not worth talking to, they're not worth saving. Standard life institutionalized is you wake up, you go to breakfast, there's a big day room, you get your medication, you sit in the day room until lunchtime, watching television. It's just incarceration. They kind of vegetate passively, and peaceably enough, but they don't live much of a life. What kind of exciting life I have, being spaced out on medication, sitting in front of a TV all day. I was totally fascinated by the TV. That was my window to the whole world. I didn't know anything else except that. One day, I'm looking at myself. I'm sitting in the same seat, in front of the same desk, watching the same dumbass TV. And one day, I just got out of my seat. I got to change this. Kelly didn't want to take the medication. He thought he knew more than the psychiatrist. Psychiatrists hate that. Psychiatrists want to be respected as, if not God, at least close to God. They had to know that my heart was in the right place and my head was screwed on right. Encouragement and intelligence on the part of therapists, uh, I do believe, did tremendous things for you, Kelly. An excellent example of the benefit of psychotherapy, extensive, time-consuming, expensive psychotherapy. Zebulon Tainter was the first doctor to believe Kelly was no longer dangerous. Tainter encouraged Kelly to seek his freedom. Remember the papers that I developed yeah, to yeah, give to each yeah. new patient? Uh, they were entitled, how to get out of here. You were, you were hopeless when I first met you. You did not. Uh, yeah. Me, hopeless? <laughs> Very hopeless, Doc. Very hopeless. Dr. Zebulon Tainter, who was the chief psychiatrist at Manhattan State Psychiatric Center, went from being dead against Kelly's release into really one of his staunchest supporters. This is a very special person to me. God, I'm awfully grateful to you, Doc. The environment I was in, the fact I didn't have no medication, I felt safe enough where I could get angry and let you see it. I was deathly afraid up until that point that I couldn't express those feelings. It's painful, sometimes it's hard, but I paid off. There was a rumor in the ward that a young state lawyer was working hard on cases no one else wanted. That was the kind of lawyer Kelly needed. I'd heard about him before I'd actually met him. Uh, he was referred to as the guy who ate a woman's heart. Dennis, uh, 
I asked him to help me to get out. Okay, he had the master plan. <laughs> you know, he uh, told me what moves to make, what to do, what to say. Uh, and I followed his instructions. Truth be told, it sounded like an interesting case. And when I met him, he seemed like an interesting guy with a very tough case. And it wasn't a case that seemed winnable when I took it on, but that's a challenge. It takes a long time for things to happen to me, but I just felt things were gonna happen. And I did what I had to do to get out. My job was as a lawyer to go up and see what I could do legally for the patients to whom I'd been assigned. My own approach as a litigator was as a real advocate for my clients. And I will say that not all lawyers take that point of view. The patients are tough. There is no security for lawyers. You're alone in a room with your client, and given the nature of confidentiality, there's really no way you can have someone there who's in a position to protect you. Hugh Kelly's case for release would not be heard before a jury. Instead, lawyers would present their cases to a judge who would make the final decision. Judge Judith Miller was the New York County Supreme Court justice who would determine Kelly's fate. Kelly had a, what they call a bad chart. The district attorney did not want him out. The attorney general's office did not want him out. My first strategy was to get an independent psychiatrist to examine Kelly. Well, I saw uh, Mr. Kelly the first time uh, in 1982, I recall. There was no question but that he had been psychotic, he'd been out of his head, however you want to put it, when he committed the terrible offense of uh, March 4, 1969. But I thought what was evident in 1982 was personality character disorder, and I did not uh, think he was uh, dangerous to himself or other people. He was rational, well-spoken. He uh, had insight into his condition, and he seemed like a thoughtful person. The more they examined Kelly, the better he looked. I think someone must be, <laughs> must be detained one place or another uh, if it can be shown clearly that they're a danger if they're left to their own devices out in the community. If you see a wolf bearing down on a flock, you're supposed to try to shoo it away or something, aren't you? Most people are afraid of people who are mentally ill. The press can be very difficult. If something had happened with Hugh Kelly, uh, they wouldn't have said that, uh, uh, that all the evidence pointed to the fact that Hugh Kelly was ready for this charge. Doctors all about that. Say, Judge releases Hugh Kelly to kill again. The judge could have thought to herself, I'll just let this ride a little while. Let him stay in the hospital. She was taking a chance. If somebody has complied with the law, it's your responsibility as a judge to obey the law and sign the order. But it's scary. <laughs> it's always scary. Anytime there's been a violent history, there's the greater likelihood of a future violence. Nobody can predict the future. In May 1980, Judge Miller signed the order for Hugh Kelly's release. They let me out in the middle of the, middle of the summer. Well, it was ridiculous. I'm a, I must have looked like somebody from the, you know, from, damn, oh, God, Jesus Christ. Somebody, why, watch where you got. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. I looked this way, I looked that way. My neck was sore after the first day. I had to take aspirin or something. Kelly was free, but he wouldn't be satisfied until Abiba, the love of his life, was also free. When she was released, I had to rush and get other living arrangements because the furnace room ain't gonna get it. My mother said the first time she saw us two together, she says, I knew as soon as I saw you two together, you're gonna get married. We got married at City Hall. Our wedding reception was down the block on the corner, donuts and coffee with my mother. <laughs> I mean, how could I possibly ever expect this to happen? I have this nice apartment. I'm married to a beautiful woman. It's simply amazing. Flight number 1644, Dallas-Fort Worth, back to Newark. At first, it was difficult for Kelly to find a job. But today, he works part-time as a travel agent. He says, Kelly, would you be willing to go to the bank, deposit the checks, and, and pick up tickets and deliver checks if you have to. It says, hey, if it ain't illegal, I'm gonna do it to make a living. It, uh, the trust, I, I don't have trust like that in my life. 
because everybody knows about the crime I committed. I make it a point to tell everybody where I work, wherever I go. I owe the people around me. I owe them. There got to be more people than me in this world that have recovered from problems like I've had. There has to be. And I just want to tell the public that at times there is people who recover from a serious mental illness. Kelly says he's found a new way to explore his understanding of his tragic past. He takes pictures of homeless people. I come from where they're at. All of them are social misfits. There for the grace of God goes I. What they have to say, they don't use in words, it's the way they look. You know how they feel. You can see. My name's Kelly, what's yours? Adrian. Adrian, how you doing? You want a cigarette? The facial expressions are unbelievable. Nice talking to you, buddy. Yeah. My heart goes out to those people because the sense of hopelessness, the sense of sadness, I just like filming the homeless because I was homeless myself at one time. He made a remarkable recovery, and I wish him well. When he lumbers up 42nd Street, he's got that Robert Mitchum stroll, that whole thing. When I first met him, he had attitude. He had attitude from the minute we met. Kind of what we'll now call his personality. Something in the nervous system is affected by a virus or something along that line. And it gets to the brain, and that's where you get your nuts. I, in my opinion, I'm not, you know, not, not a doctor. I, I know a lot of guys who would agree with me. We all have it to some degree, depression, rage, anger. He probably has more than most, but a lot more control than most. So it even... it can even out. He has told me uh, more than once in the past that he wanted to be viewed not as an oddball or, or the freak he was when he did the terrible thing he did, uh, but rather as the person he is now. Kind of poignant. An old expression in the West Side, get the women and children off the street. I hope that they rejuvenated him because he could go off any minute. It's easy to hate a man who's done a terrible crime. Kelly's a rare success. I mean, I have to say, he's not typical by any means of anybody. It must be very difficult for anyone who's been a victim of a crime. You can never replace a person who has gone on. And it's very, very hard to, to be forgiving under those circumstances. I was honest. And I, and I wasn't lying about who I am. This is me. If you can't take it, hey, you know, like, uh, I can't help it. 